Welcome to lecture 13, where we will discuss the science of studying. Now, students can understand what they do as trying to get as much information as they can into long-term memory. What we're going to talk about is the science behind how to do that as efficiently as possible. So what do students do? They need to encode information, they need to make sure it's stored, and they need to retrieve that information. So we've got those three boxes, right? How do you encode, store, and retrieve information as efficiently as possible? Well, here's what most students do. They read and reread notes, watch and rewatch lectures, read and reread slides, textbooks. And let me ask you students, how's that working for you? It's not, is it? It doesn't work well at all. It's a really inefficient study strategy. When you just read things over and over again or watch lectures over and over again, what you're doing is something called maintenance rehearsal, maintenance rehearsal. It's just the simple repetition or recycling of information. The information is not processed deeply. It's processed very superficially. You're just trying to repeat it over and over to yourself. And it's quickly lost because it doesn't transfer to long-term memory. Maintenance rehearsal is geared to keeping information in short-term memory. It is not designed to get information to transfer from short-term memory into long-term memory. And that's why you can spend hours and days repeating material, rereading textbooks, passively watching lectures. When it comes to the exam, you won't find anything in your brain. Why? Because it's maintenance rehearsal you've been doing. What you need to be doing, the efficient way to study, actually save you time and you'll remember more, is elaborative rehearsal. And what do I mean by that? I mean you need to think about the material in a deeper, more complex way. And that doesn't have to take more time, right? Um, what you need to do to get information into long-term memory is to make it meaningful to you. It's got to be, you, you, if you don't understand the material, if it doesn't have meaning, if it's just some abstract principle, it's going to go in your short-term memory and be gone. To get something in your long-term memory and to keep it there, you need elaborative rehearsal. Elaborative rehearsal. So let me prove it to you. Here's a study where people memorized a list of words. Okay, There were three different groups of subjects. One group of subjects, when they got each word, they answered the question, did the word begin with a capital letter? So they're processing the information at a very shallow, superficial level. Okay? I mean, it's a little bit of an analysis. They're doing more than just repeating whale trait happy car, whale trait happy car over and over again. But it's not much. Is it a capital letter? Uh, the second group got the same list of words, and they um, asked the question for each word, did the word rhyme with weight? So they are processing it in terms of the sound of the word. A little deeper. The third group, um, after they got each word, they asked themselves, would that word fit in a particular sentence? How about the sentence, he met a blank in the street? It's like, okay, the word whale. He met a whale in the street. Okay, I guess that's all right. Yeah, I'll say, yeah, that fits. How about the next one? He met a trait in the street. No, that doesn't make any sense. So at least this time you're processing in terms of meaning. So three groups of subjects studied the same list of words for the same amount of time. They just asked themselves different questions during the study time. And what happened? Well, the percentage of words remembered is shown here. The more deeply subjects thought about the words, the better they remembered them. People who thought about the meaning of the words remembered or yeah, recognized 80% of the words, whereas folks who just analyze the words in terms of whether the first letter was a capital or not, capital letter, only remembered less than 20% of the words. So reading a word doesn't mean you're going to remember it, but pulling meaning out of what you're remembering 
that'll lead to this 80% memory. So stop doing the inefficient memory. This is a study, the science of how to study. Pay attention to this lecture, do some of this stuff, and your performance on your exams is gonna go way up and you're gonna save yourself a ton of time and frustration. So the Craik and Lockhart study, depth of processing. The more deeply you process information, the better you are, the more likely you are to remember it. Now, sometimes you're studying stuff that no matter how much you pull out your hair, you cannot find a way to get meaning out of it. What do you have to do then? Then you have to create mnemonic devices. You have to create some intentional way, some way of getting meaning in there. Um, so uh, mnemonic devices require a little work on the front end. You sort of have to memorize these structures ahead of time. Um, but they really help. They're very, very powerful. And they're a way of adding meaning where you wouldn't normally have meaning. They're actually techniques that have been used for centuries. Um, for example, now when people give long lectures, they have teleprompters or they can write it down on a piece of paper. But for a lot of human history, that wasn't possible. So you had to memorize what issues you wanted to hit or what order you wanted to talk about various things using mnemonic devices. Here's just a couple of examples. Um, the word gray can be spelled two different ways, depending on whether you're in the US or England. You can spell gray G-R-A-Y or G-R-E-Y. How can you remember which way to spell it? Well, A is the first letter of America, and if you spell gray with an A, you're in America. E is the first letter of England, and if you spell gray with an E, that's the English spelling. Easy, right? It's not arbitrary. Now you've got some meaning there. You've added meaning to it. Uh, Roy G. Biv, person's name, makes it really easy to remember the order of colors in a rainbow, or if you're interested in color vision, then the order in which different wavelengths are associated with different perceived colors. So Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green for G, blue, indigo, violet. Easy. I'd never remember it otherwise. Otherwise, it'd just be arbitrary. There's a mnemonic device for remembering which months have 31 days, and it involves your knuckles. If you have a knuckle there, then it's 31 days. So you start over here, January has 31 days, February does not. March has 31 days, April does not. Go on and on, right? Uh, July has 31 days, what's the next one? August, that also has 31 days. So these are mnemonic devices, examples of mnemonic devices. Um, here's another couple of examples that people use all the time. One that's very common is called the method of loci. And loci is just plural for locations. This particular mnemonic is terrific when you need to remember information in a particular order. And what you do is you think about some place that you know really well, maybe like your apartment. Or if you take the same walk every day from your home to work, that would be great too. And what you do is you think about the different locations on your walk to work or the different locations in your apartment as you walk through them. And what you do is you use mental imagery. You imagine the thing that you need to talk about first, some visual image of that. You imagine that thing in the first spatial location. So if you're starting to walk to work, maybe at your front door, you remember I don't know, if you have to talk about panda bears first, then you remember a panda at your front door. And then maybe you walk to the sidewalk, uh, you leave your front door and walk to the sidewalk, and then you have to talk about eagles, so you imagine an eagle standing there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then when you want to retrieve things in a particular order, you just take that walk through your apartment or that walk to work, and you think panda bear, eagle, that's a method of low sign. That works really well. Another one is the peg word method. Instead of locations, the peg word method relies on rhyming. So you have to create pegs. So what you do is you have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then for one, you think of bun, two, shoe, three, tree, four, door. And if I have to remember a list of words in a particular order, I'd say, okay, I need to remember newspaper first. So I'll remember a newspaper in a hamburger bun. 
So I'll make a mental image of this big hamburger with newspaper in it so that when I think of bun, I think of newspaper. Um, number two, shaving cream. Maybe I imagine somebody filling up fancy shoes with uh, shaving cream. Three tree, maybe I think of pens, maybe a pen tree, right? Instead of apples growing off the tree, it's pens. Um, four door, umbrella, maybe I imagine somebody's stuck, you know, tried to walk through a door and their umbrella got stuck in there, right? So you just keep going down that list and then you think back, okay, what was in the bun? Oh yeah, hamburger bun, uh, newspapers. What's in the shoe? Oh, whipped cream, that's two, shoe. Three is a tree, what's three? Oh, pen, because of the pen tree. Four is door, umbrella. See how well that works? Peg word method. Now, why do these techniques work? Because they create meaningful associations. Information is stored in your brain. Memories are stored in your brain according to a network of meaningful associations. So when we try to retrieve information out of our brains, we have to find it down these roadways of meaningful associations. We have to be able to navigate that network. So if the network is based on meaningful associations, then you gotta know the meaning of the content in order to find it in long-term memory. We use the word retrieval cue to refer to anything that helps you retrieve information. So some people, um, if they need to remember something, they might tie a string around their finger, right? I always, when I drove home from work, I would always take something and put it over my steering wheel so that I literally couldn't drive home until I said, why is this sweatshirt on my steering wheel? Oh yeah, I'm supposed to go pick up the dry cleaning. Come right back and we'll talk about why meaning matters.